John chapter 15 was where we're going to be at. You know, while I was away for a few weeks, I had a lot of time to think about, you know, the sermons and and where uh, I've been going. And actually, um, before you had actually called me as your pastor, when I was serving as um, the uh, interim pastor, I had uh, written out a, a number of passages that I felt like I could probably make it to not knowing exactly where all that would lead. And and that ran out the Sunday before I left. And so I was like, well, you know, I need to go ahead and outline the rest of the book of John since y'all stuck with me now. <laughs> Praise the Lord on that one. And um, I just got to thinking, you know, I trust that God's word, wherever we're at in God's word, God's word has the power in itself. To meet the needs of wherever we are individually. I don't know where you guys are in your life. I don't know what each individual person is struggling with. You don't know what I'm struggling with. But God's word is so powerful and effective that it can touch me where I'm at. And it can touch you where you're at. And it can touch somebody else wherever they're at. Same passage applied multiple ways to each one of our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that. And as, I, as we look and continue to look in John, I just I trust that God's word is, is powerful and effective enough for that. If you found John 15, you stand with me for the honor of reading God's word. John records these words of Jesus. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. By this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, and looking into your word, we just, Father, we admit that we desperately need your spirit to help us. God, I pray that you'd help us to understand your word, Lord. Help us to apply it to our life. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us through your word, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to abide in you this morning, that we might bear much fruit. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. These words of Christ to his disciples before his arrest on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray were meant to encourage and to instruct. And I've heard this passage for years and I've wrestled with some interpretations of it, just to be honest with you. There are many interpretations of what Jesus is saying, and uh, I feel a, a great burden on me to explain it to the best of my ability through the power of the Spirit. I want to be as faithful to the Word of God as possible. If maybe you've heard it explained differently, just as I have, perhaps, in in certain areas, just know that we're all on a path to maturity in Christ. I want you to grow in your walk with Jesus. The men who've explained it to me in the past, they wanted me to grow in in my walk with Jesus. They want that. We want that. And Jesus wanted that for his disciples. He wanted them to be secure in their walk with him, knowing what he was going to face, that in just a few hours they would see him arrested and then he would be beaten and then crucified and buried. He would die for their sins. This was a very critical time for them. And so Jesus was trying to encourage and to instruct them. And we look at this passage and go, well, some of this, how can it be instructive? How can it be encouraging But as we look at this passage, I want you to see, first of all, we're looking at who is the true vine. Jesus is saying, here's your life. Here's how life is. It's like a vine. It's like a grapevine. I don't know about you, but I've got some grapevines in my yard. I've got some scobernong, I think is what it is. 
And occasionally they'll produce, and usually it's the birds that come and grab them, or it's the ants that get them, or something else. And I'll be honest with you, I am not a vine dresser. My extent of a green thumb is putting my... (laughs) I do not make things grow. (laughs) The, The best success I've ever had of planting anything in my yard has been a pumpkin patch that grew out of a compost pile that I threw together and all of a sudden there were pumpkins everywhere. Little pumpkins, I don't know how they grew. They grew, praise the Lord, we had a bunch of them. That's been the extent of my success in gardening. I've tried, I literally have tried, but I am not that good at it. And so I think some of the misunderstanding that I've had over this passage comes from my lack of understanding of what it takes to tend a vine. You know, you've got to put a lot of effort into something like that for it to continually produce year after year after year. Jesus is the true vine. But the father is the one who's the vine dresser. And the father tends the vine for growth. Jesus is the vine. He's rooted in the ground. He he receives the nutrients and distributes them to the branches. That central trunk of the vine, that trunk that may come up from the ground and split into many pieces, is not the branches. It's not just the lower part of it that comes up out of the ground. You may see it going along a trellis. That, that so, just that small part coming up before it separates is part of the, of the vine. It is, it is the source of it. But even as it separates out into its many, branch, its many uh, extensions of that trunk, and there's a technical term for it, and I couldn't tell you what it is, but if you were a grape grower, you would know exactly what it would be. Every single part of that that is not a branch that produces fruit is the vine, and this is what Jesus is talking about. All of that part of the tree that remains, the vine that remains after the growth has gone every year, Jesus is saying, that's me. I'm the vine. I'm rooted in the ground. I distribute to the branches, the trunk, the arms, everything on a grapevine, but the fruiting branches is the vine. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Our portion of what, a, of what part of the, of the vine we are, the branches we are, is a small part And not as important as the trunk. It's incidental that there are little branches that grow off of the trunk that actually produce fruit. It's it's actually a quite interesting structure for those who are into that kind of a thing that they are worried about and concerned about. Is the structure of the vine set up to produce fruit? And we know that there's no problem with Jesus. Jesus is set up. So that if we're connected to him, we will produce fruit. Okay, there's no problem with Jesus. The question is us. Are we healthy? Are we healthy branches? The father is the vine dresser. I watched some YouTube videos. University of YouTube is very interesting. You can find all sorts of informative uh, videos on there and tell you all about all sorts of things. And I watched some expert vine dressers just in my opinion mutilate a vine to make it more healthy. And maybe you're like some people as you drive through the city of Loosedale and go, oh my goodness, what have they done to the crepe myrtles? And if I've heard one person complain about it, I've heard about uh, many people. How did they, why did they do that? Why did they cut off everything? It just looks so ugly. But do you realize that if they didn't do that, that it wouldn't look as nice as it does when it flowers out and it branches shoot up five, ten feet full of leaves, all of those things that happen within just a mere month or two after the beginning of the growth begins. But it's in the middle of the winter. It looks like somebody just took a hacksaw to it and chopped everything off that mattered. The structure that the growth comes from is beautiful in and of itself if we understand how necessary it is that it be pruned a certain way for growth to occur. So the father is the vine dresser. He comes in, he's watching the growth. He's paying attention to the fruitfulness. His aim is that it bears more fruit. And he's concerned not only for the structure, but also for the outcome. And so a person who is a professional grape grower, and maybe they're concerned about those things, they're out there in their field on a daily, weekly basis. They're looking 
They're checking each of those plants. They're pruning as they go. They're cutting away the things that aren't necessary. They're setting up for future growth. They're concerned about all of those things because the final outcome is the grapes, the fruit, the fruit that they want. The method of pruning that we look at here is is interesting because we don't understand much about it unless we've been doing it ourselves. We might look at a vine and I've got them growing in my yard. We've got them growing out here on the church. They're they're growing all over the place. And there are certain times where the growth is instantaneous, it seems like. Like yesterday, that wasn't there. And all of a sudden, it's covering the side of the building, right? And we look at all that growth and we go, oh, that growth looks good. But if somebody who's paying attention to vines and that's what they do, they would be able to tell you whether or not that growth was good growth. And they would be able to tell you what needs to happen and where it needs to be cut off and where it needs to be trained so that it can go beyond that. The father knows all of those things. And when we look at this passage here, verse two through verse five has been verse six has been some that really have been frustrating for me to understand. But as I've watched these men do this and understood their methodology, it's helped me to understand what Jesus is saying here. Every branch In me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. I've heard this interpreted that if you're not bearing fruit, you're gone. And that's not biblical. When a when a grapevine, when a vine of any sort there like that begins to grow branches that are not bearing fruit. That vine dresser may take that branch and elevate it. The word here. Is the word iro. It's to lift up, to raise, to suspend, to elevate. And so you take that little branch that's coming off of the vine and you elevate it and put it on a trellis and tie it off to it so that it has some support. Words matter, they have meaning. And the way that we interpret it matters. Context is key to this. There are some branches that will not bear fruit for a while. They need support. In fact, all of us as branches off of the vine need the support of not only the vine, but the trellis. The trellis is a very important part of the mechanism of how the grapevine becomes fruitful. You could say that the Lord lifts up that, that branch. He takes it away. He elevates it. And gives it some support. And this is why we need the support of church. We need the support of fellowship. We need the support of one another. We need the support of the Holy Spirit helping us. God's all over this process. The branches that are not yet bearing fruit, he takes away. And he lifts it up and he supports it. But the branch that bears fruit, every branch that does bear fruit. What happens at the end of the year After the fruit has already been harvested and it's time to prune, usually in the winter, that vine dresser will go through there and to us who are unaccustomed to this, he will mercilessly cut away all of that new growth, leaving a couple nubs off of the main vine. To us, it looks like he cut off the entire vine. He cut off the entire branch. Like there's no more branch there. Why, why would he cut off this two, three, four, five feet of, of vine that was fruitful? But what he knows is by leaving those two, three, four inches of vine or, or of that branch connected to the vine, still attached to the vine, that branch is still there. It's just time for that branch to rest And to hibernate for the winter or be strengthened for the time until the next harvest. And had he not cut it off back at that point, the next year there would be no fruit on that branch. So every branch that does bear fruit, it gets pruned. It gets cut off. That extra growth that's unnecessary for the next year's harvest is chopped off. It it gets cut off so that it will bear more fruit. Its purpose is to bear fruit. That's the only reason that that branch is attached to the vine so that it can bear fruit. Not so that it can get big and green and lush and look great and be extensive. It doesn't have to be very big. Size does not matter here. What matters is, is it connected? Is it connected to the central vine? 
Is that one branch connected to the central vine and can it produce fruit the next year? Now, we're used to all sorts of different kinds of trees. I grew up in an area where there were a lot of evergreen trees, and I would never think of going up to a Douglas fir and chopping off all of its limbs in hopes that next year it would become more lush and green. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, if you do that, you're going to have a very ugly tree. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. But with a grapevine, you have to cut it back. Otherwise, it gets unmanageable. The father's a vine dresser. He's tending for growth. And Jesus is saying, look, guys, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. You already know this. You're, you're already a branch. You're already connected. But I, what I want you to understand is Jesus is saying here, if you abide in the vine, me, you will bear fruit. If you abide in the vine, you will bear fruit. It's a one plus one equals two proposition. It's going to happen. If a branch is connected to the vine and it's been pruned properly, it will bear fruit. And that's the responsibility of the vine dresser. And that's what God does in our lives. Have you ever had a time in your life where you've been doing something that maybe you've enjoyed it? And maybe it's not bad. But the Lord comes along and says, that's got to go. Cuts that off. And we go through those times and it's not exciting, it's not fun, but the Lord cuts those things off and says, that's really not where you need to be spending all that energy. Jesus says, if you remain in me, abide in me, remain, stay connected to, and I in you, this this connection of the branches and the trunk, the main vine, we're connected to it. If you stick with me, if you abide with me, if you stay connected with me, you will bear fruit. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, neither or unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I've actually tried this in the past where you've gone th- where I've gone through my yard and my yard's a mess. Don't come to my yard if you want to see a better homes and garden house of the year, lawn of the year. It's not happening, okay? I believe in <laughs> my yard's a mess. <laughs> it is. Where I've gone through and chopped off a limb of one of these vines, and I thought, well, can I just plant it? Can, can I plant it in the ground? Of course, you know, that doesn't happen. Like if you cut off a grapevine... It's hanging off of the, you know, cut off one of those branches and you stick it in a container and you water it and you fertilize it and you do all those things that you think are necessary. It's never going to produce. Now, what you can do is cut off, you can cut off one of those branches and you could graft it into something else. In fact, I've bought a lot of fruit trees over the years that have been nothing but graftings. And usually because of my poor management skills in the, in the gardening area, after that main fruit tree dies, that uh, root stock begins to grow. And you know what I'm talking about. It's got the long needles on it and it's real prickly. And I'm thinking, that's not the lemon tree that I bought. <laughs> okay. Well, it's growing because I didn't tend to it. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand how to take care of it. And maybe through my failures, the Lord has been showing me, hey, there's a better way here. You need to take care of this. Jesus is saying, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. The branch has to be connected to the trunk. It's got to be there. We have to have it. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. If you disconnect it and just hang it out there in the middle of the air, it will never get its nutrients. It'll never get its water. You can get the sunlight and you can get the rain, but it'll never have what it needs because the branch in and of itself cannot bear fruit if it's apart from the vine. The one function of the branch is to stay connected to the vine. And if you cut off the branch, it dies. It's fruitless. It will not grow fruit. We desperately need to stay connected to Christ to grow and be fruitful. This is so important that Jesus states to them, guys, I'm the vine. You're the branches. And I think sometimes we get this backwards. That sometimes we think Jesus needs us. Jesus doesn't need us. We need him. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. All of the effort that we put into our life and all the work that we do, apart from Christ, 
amounts to absolutely nothing. We get a zero gain from it, and we waste our time and effort. Apart from Christ, we fail. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Jesus is divine. We are, not a, we are the branches. That's what we are. If we understand this, we will bear fruit. Because what it'll do is put it into the proper perspective. We need to pay attention to what's feeding us. We need to pay attention to what we are connected to. And if you are listening to or connected to the world more than you are listening to and connected to Christ, then the fruit that you bear will resemble that. But if you are listening to Christ and you are connected to his word and you are obeying him, then the fruit that comes off of that branch will resemble that. I've had some very fruitful vines, again, not of my own accord, in my yard, and the fruit resembles it. But there have been some very unhealthy vines in my yard, and you look at the fruit and go, I can't even eat it. It's not even fit for the birds. Jesus is the vine, not us. I'm not the vine. Your mom's not the vine. Your dad's not the vine. A former pastor is not the vine. Some on, on the you know, TV or radio or internet preacher is not the vine. We're all servants of the same God. Jesus is the vine. And we all need to be connected to him individually. Now we might be able to encourage one another. We're on that same vine. That, that same vine and as branches we're saying stay connected. Right? That's what we need to be saying. Stay connected guys. We, we are together in this. And as we walk together in Christ, we will bear fruit together. But when we see people who are not connected to Christ and they're in Christ, but they're not connected to him, they're not they're not staying connected to him. We need to encourage them to stay connected to Christ. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. If we don't abide in Christ, if we don't stay connected to Christ, the nutrients The growth, the life will not be there. And maybe you've had plants that you've planted that that some parts of it are healthy and other parts of it are not. And we wonder, well, what happened to this part? It's because it wasn't staying connected to the vine. What happens to that part that that is not fruitful? You can walk through an area of trees, fruit trees, and you can... You can feel the tenderness of the branch and you can actually walk up to it and you can look at it and say, well, this is not healthy. And you could basically reach over and snap that piece off and you can go down a little further and and that part might still be tender. I've, I've actually watched Net do this and she'll just walk through and she'll go, that's that's not healthy. That breaks off, but that's still good. The part that's still good, that's still tender is that way because it's still connected. And let's just say our life this, in this season of growth of, off of the vine, say we have five foot of growth. But that last foot is not really strong and it's, it's not receiving the nutrients and so it dies. But you still have a little bit of growth back here and still some strength back there. What the vine dresser will do is come through and he'll cut off all of that. He'll get rid of everything that's not, that's not good. That part that is not connected is gathered up and thrown away and burned. And that's what the vine dresser does. At the end of the season, after all the harvest has been taken, he goes through and tends to the vine. He cuts off all the things that are unnecessary, leaving a portion of the branch still intact. The branch is still there. But the Lord cuts away all of the unnecessary portions. And it's dried up and it's withered. It's no longer necessary the vine dresser takes all that wood and throws it into the fire and it's burnt. It's not necessary. Now, I've heard this passage preached that if you're not abiding in Christ and you're not doing this, that, and the other thing, that he throws the whole branch away. But as I've watched how these guys do this, that's not the case. To us, the untrained eye, it looks like the whole branch got chopped off, but that didn't happen. He cut it back To where it can grow. And the Lord may cut out a large portion of your life. That is unfruitful and unnecessary. So that you can be fruitful 
and stay connected in growth in him. Because a grapevine is not like an evergreen tree. A grapevine is a very different creature than many other types of fruit trees and other things. God will cut off everything that is unnecessary. And we might look at it like that was an area of growth and that was a lot of growth. It literally sprouted out and that was a lot of growth. Why didn't we just leave that? It's because that growth, though good and had its own purpose, needed to be chopped off so that we can be fruitful. And even for the vine that is fruitful, it doesn't need to grow super long to be fruitful. It just needs to grow long enough for fruit to appear. And everything beyond that is unnecessary. That's the hard part for us to understand. But I've got everything is going well, Lord. Why, 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 why did this door open and everything is going well here? And then I can't go beyond that. That's frustrating for us because we want to see more. We want to see longer. We want to see more green. Jesus wants to see more fruit. Jesus is not concerned about how long. <laughs> Jesus is not concerned about how big and how showy. He's concerned about that cluster of grapes, that fruit. He's concerned about that. If we're not connected to him, that part is cut away and thrown away and burned. Well, why? Why why is this the case? The vine dresser does this because... Much fruit brings glory to the Father. If I had a vineyard and that vineyard never produced, people would say, not a very good vineyard owner. But if that vineyard produced and I had tons of grapes and people came from far and wide to gather them, people would, that news would spread. Hey, he's got a fruitful vineyard. It's to the glory of the vineyard owner and tender to make sure that each of those plants on, in his vineyard grows much fruit brings glory to the father and we might question well why is this one a great harvest and this one not that's the wrong question the real question is how can i individually stay connected to the vine so that i can produce fruit that brings honor to the lord i don't care what the lord does everywhere else I'm glad that the Lord is doing those things everywhere else. I'm grateful for it. I love to see where the Lord shows up and, you know, 100 people get baptized and thousands of people are discipled and churches are planted and grown. I'm concerned. What I need to be concerned most of is the fruit in my own life. Am I connected to the grapevine? Am I connected as a branch to the vine, to Christ? Because if I'm connected, then growth will happen. There will be much fruit What fruit there is becomes useful to God. The fruit of the Spirit shows up in our life. The Lord moves through our life. The harvest always comes. And in this, the Father is glorified when there's much fruit. And by this, it shows that we are disciples of Christ. We're listening to what Jesus says. We're doing what Jesus is telling us to do. We're connected to him. We're obeying him. It shows by the much fruit in our life. It shows the effort, the work of the Father in and through us. We are Christ's workmanship, created in God for good works that he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. We belong to him. And he works through us to produce much fruit. Jesus said, look, if you abide in me and I in you, showing that connection, you're staying connected. You can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And people take this out of context and all of a sudden they're wishing for things that that have nothing to do with what the vine wants. If you are a branch connected to the vine, you will always ask what the vine wants because that's the only thing that you're getting. You're connected. You're getting the nutrients from the vine. The vine wants to produce fruit. You're connected. So you ask, give me more nutrients so that I can bear fruit. We will always ask if we're connected to Christ. We will always ask in accordance with what he wants. What we ask of him will not be against him. You can't be connected to the grapevine and ask God for for you to produce an apple. That's not going to happen. You will produce grapes as the Lord wants you to. This is freedom. This is joy. This is good. 
This is something that the Lord has designed for us. Ask whatever you wish, it will be done. If you're being filled with the, with the vine, you'll not ask, you're not going to ask anything apart from his will. The things that you ask will be his will. He wants to perform his will. His will is fruitfulness. How big of a cluster will he bring in your life? I like to go out and, and look in my yard and just see the happenstance of how the Lord has blessed certain grapevines. And it's always neat to, to me to go out there in early spring where, where you see the little, the little nubs start popping out. And you go, well, man, there's probably 20 on that little cluster there. But I guarantee it, it, it would be something if just one would show up and appear towards the end of that. Now, it might be different now that I know how to tend my vine. I might end up with a bigger cluster. The will of God is fruitfulness. The will of the grape, ten, the, the vine tender is fruitfulness. And that brings glory to God. That's what the Lord wants. And Jesus says, all you need to do is abide in me. Just stay with me. Stay connected to me. The father loves the son. The vine dresser loves his vine. The son loves us. The, the vine loves his branches. Jesus produces fruit through us in our lives. There is work done in the kingdom of God through those who love Jesus and have been born again. It's through us in this world that these greater works are being done. If we can keep his commandments, we are abiding in his love. The branches must listen to the vine for life, for direction, for growth. We have to understand that we are not the vine. We're the branches. Just as Jesus abided in the father and kept his commandments, we need to do the same. And the closer we walk with Christ, the more faithful we are to him, the more we listen to his voice the more fruit there will be in our lives. That's just the simple truth of it. Jesus said this, I've spoken these things to you so that your joy might be full, that my joy might be in you. That the sap that's running through me as a vine might be in you as a branch. That that life-giving spirit that is in me as the vine might overflow into your life as the branch and that you might grow strong and produce fruit. The joy of Christ in you, the Holy Spirit in you, producing fruit in your life. We are stronger when we are filled with Christ's life and with his love. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. I want to see you grow in your walk with Christ. I don't, I don't want to, to see you just so buckled down with this world and sin and, and all of that. I want to see you growing in your walk with Christ. And I know just from my own life, the times that I've been walking with Christ, those have been the times that the Lord has done great things in me and through me. There have been much fruit. Not for my glory, but for the glory of the Lord. And the times that I have walked away from the Lord, those have been the most frustrating times. Because I'm not connected to the vine. So I went back and I looked at this passage and I thought, well, you know, that that preaches well. But what can we pull from that? What well, what are some truths that we can that we can uh, apply to this? So I've got I've got nine points. You want to write them down? You can. I'll, whatever you want to do. I give us. I'll give this list to you after the service. Number one, Christ is the vine, not us. And that's the hardest thing for sometimes for us to grasp. Growth does not come from Jason. It comes from Jesus. I need Christ. He has what we need for life. Christ is a vine, not us. Number two, the father is the vine dresser. Simple statement, but it holds so much. As such, he cuts away 
what he deems unnecessary for us to be fruitful and to grow. And that's never pleasant when we want to hold on to all those things that we think are necessary. That leads me to a fourth or a third point. Not all growth is good growth. There's a lot of things that we spend our time on and our effort on and our energies on that may seem good from the outward appearance. And it might be growth. There might be something happening, but it's not all good growth. And so some of that growth needs to be directed. It needs to be trained. It needs to be cut off. It needs to be removed so that where we are growing and necessarily growing, that that can happen so that we can be fruitful. Um, that's, that's a difficult one. Number four, the word cleanses us. The word of God that is spoken, the word of God that is read, the word of God that God has recorded for us, it cleanses us. Just as Jesus, the word become flesh, cleanses us and makes us righteous. Number four, or five, Connection with Christ is the only way to, bear, way to bear fruit. You will never bear fruit apart from Jesus. Do you want your life to be filled with the, with the fruit of the Spirit? You will never have the fruit of the Spirit in your life if you're not connected to Christ. If you're not listening to the Holy Spirit whispering in your heart, if you're not in God's Word listening to what God's Word says and having God's Word penetrate you, you will never bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And you might sit there and go, well, why is my life not reflecting Christ? It's because you're not listening. You're not connected. You're not allowing the Lord to be what you're feeding on. You're feeding on the world. The branch has to be connected to the vine for growth. It just, it's a simple truth. Simple truth. Number six, God throws away what is useless. Yeah. You know, a lot of us in our spiritual life, we're like hoarders. If you've ever watched that show, it's quite funny, some of the things, and sad too, because you just, you have to realize that there, man, we live like this, right? We cling on to everything. And some things are very difficult for us to let go, but the Lord delights in cutting it away. The Lord delights in cutting it away. It's his prerogative for growth. And we need this. We desperately need some things cut away. We need it cut away. Number seven. God is glorified by the fruit, the harvest of fruit in our lives. When we honor God in our lives, he is glorified. What is the chief end of man? Us as Baptists probably have never heard this. But if you've ever studied any of the confessions and creeds, you should know the answer to this question. The chief end of man is to glorify, to enjoy God and to glorify him forever. Or it should be the other way around, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Because our, our chief purpose in life is to bring God glory. God's glorified by much fruit in our life. Well, number eight. And we're, we'll close up here pretty quickly. Let me write this down. Fruitfulness proves discipleship. Look around you. The evidence is undeniable. If you walk into a grape or a vineyard, you will see the proof of what the vine dresser has been doing. It's undeniable. Growth will occur if the vines have been tended. If they've not been tended, it will be so random, like my yard. That it's like, how does anything grow here? And I told that on the way here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to murderize my vines this, this, this winter. I, I'm going to chop them all to pieces. Because now I understand what needs to happen. And look, there's a lot of things that we spend our time on. I've said this, that's not good. But if we're being fruitful, the discipleship is there. And that's what I want to see here. I want to see us discipling one another and discipling others and see others raised up to disciple others. I off, I've often walked into churches as a supply minister and you don't have to tell me what happened. I already know what happened because I walk in and saw, I see the evidence of it. 
I can look at my own life and say, well, well, why am I not feeling well or out of shape? Well, it's because I haven't been working out. There's been growth in the wrong areas, right? Okay, all right. But if I do the right thing and honor the Lord and, and direct that growth, then the right outcome will come. And I can make fun of myself. You can make fun of me too. It doesn't matter. The truth is, the evidence is always there about what happened in our personal lives, in the way that we treat one another. I can remember when I was a foreman at Ingalls and I had to give an account for the work that my, the guys on my crew did. I had to give an account for what they did. Well, if I, I was paying attention. I knew what was going on. I knew whether or not they were doing their work. And all I could say was they didn't do their work or they did their work. And this outcome was happening. The outcome always shows up. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. You're going to figure it out. It's going to show what really happened. And all you've got to do is pay attention to the signs there. Fruitfulness proves discipleship. Number nine. The love of Christ calls for us to stay connected to him. Because Jesus loves us so much, he says, keep my commandments and live. Just, just do what I'm telling you to do. It's because he loves us so much that he tells us what he wants us to do. Love God. Love our neighbor as ourselves. Treat each other with respect. Be filled with the Spirit. It's the love of God. When you open up the Bible and you read the red letters or any of the letters... What you need to see is this is God's love for us. He loves us. And he's calling for us to stay connected to him. He wants us to be close to him. And the last point, that's the final one. The joy of Christ can fill us. I don't know where you're at in your life today. I don't know what you're dealing with. But the joy of Christ can fill you to overflowing. If we listen and obey. If you stay connected to Christ, the outcome will be that you will be filled with his joy. Test me in that. Stay connected to Jesus. We're going to close with a time of invitation. The Lord's moving in your heart. Maybe you want to pray for somebody. I want to encourage you to do that. But I'll be here at the front if you need someone to pray for you. But you may just want to take a few moments as Kim comes and plays the piano just to consider the words of God. Not my words, the words of God. And then apply that to your life. Will you stand with me as we pray? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just move in us, Lord, individually and corporately to accomplish what you already want to do. And Father, as we stay connected to you, Lord, I pray that you would bear much fruit in us. And Lord God, if there's something that you need to cut out of our life, I pray that you would do it swiftly and without regard to what we feel about it. But Lord, that you would have your way in us. God, I pray that you would move among your people this morning. I pray that you would bless with your presence, even in our response. In Jesus' name we pray.